Welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for attending this global tech webinar on India. My name is Simon Bush and I'm the Chief Executive of the Australian Information Industry Association. It's an absolute pleasure for the AAA to host these informative webinars with our value partners at Austrade. We have a great registration numbers for today's global tech webinar in India, which is market, so the market must be of enormous interest to, to Australians looking to grow their business over there. Just noting that this event is also being recorded let us begin today by recognizing the tens of thousands of years of innovation that have been handed down through the generations from the original custodians on the lands on which we meet today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today. And for me here in Canberra, it's the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to the elders and past and present. We move to the housekeeping slide, thanks. Um, as you can see, this we're using the Slido app for those who are unaware. It's a QA and a app. It's fantastic. Either enter slido.com into your URL on your phone or your browser or scan that uh, QR code. And that's, that's an opportunity for you to ask questions to our wonderful panellists. Um, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Divya Scheme to give a welcome from Austrade. Thanks, Simon. My name is Divya and I'm a Senior Advisor in Austrade Technology Centre of Excellence and I'm thrilled to welcome you on behalf of Austrade to this webinar. Our team supports Australian tech companies looking to position themselves competitively in global markets. We're proud to partner with AIIA to have hosted eight successful global tech webinars over the course of 2022. This series has featured some of the most exciting emerging Asian markets for Australian tech companies to consider, from Vietnam to the Philippines, Malaysia, and Singapore. In today's session, we'll hear from a market that is beautifully positioned for continued technology partnership with Australia, and that is India. Leading Australian firms like the ANZ Bank, Atlassian and Telstra are already committed to the market. We hope this webinar provides you and your business insights into working with the Indian market. To talk more on that though, I'll now pass to Sam Freeman, who is Austrade's Trade and Investment Commissioner in Bengaluru. Thanks, Divya. And um, also thank you to Simon and, and the team at AWIA um, for partnering with us on this. It's a real pleasure to have the might of their organization with us um, as we look to open the eyes of India to, to a whole bunch of new companies and maybe some companies that have also uh, spent some time in market as well. So I'm just gonna give a very brief um, understanding of, of where the tech sector is at at the moment, and then um, we'll go through the agenda. But the tech sector in India at the moment is really experiencing some very eye-watering statistics in terms of its growth. And it's part of the reason why India is becoming such a superpower. Uh, around the world. In 2002, the financial year 2002, the technology industry in India grew uh, around or more than 15%, um, which is the highest ever. It's worth more than 325 billion Australian dollars in revenue that the sector generates. And a big key to this growth is the combination of digitization of the economy and as well domestic innovation. And we'll touch on some of that today with the, the speakers that we've brought together. Um, what this has meant for Australian businesses, and, and you're going to hear from two excellent examples of those today, is that the narrative around India has changed. Um, in the past, India might have been looked at as an opportunity for cost arbitrage, um, but that's no longer the case for all the businesses that we work with that operate in the market. The access to talent in India means the companies that are here now and are experiencing India view the market as, as a significant factor in their ability to be globally competitive. Uh, we've got Telstra on the call, um, Divya mentioned some of the others, but the major companies that are here, like CBA, Atlassian, ANZ, um, they have substantial investments in innovation and research and development centres across the country and a lot of them here in, in Bengaluru where I'm based. Um, and the reason they've done this is that it provides a direct benefit back to their Australian consumers and to consumers they operate uh, and work within other markets around the globe. So it's not all roses 
um, India is a complex market and with the way business is done here, it's not a culture, it's not a market that can be tackled from 8,000 kilometers away. It's a market that demands companies have a long-term vision uh, and they're willing to spend the time, money and energy identifying the right partners and developing a tailored strategy for clients. Um, companies that are willing to do so, and we're going to hear from two of them today, will find partners in India that are ready to co-invest and ready to co-create the right brand and present in the market. So that's just a very brief overview um, of how Austrade sees the market and, and what we've learned from our clients that we work with here. I'm going to go through the agenda of today's session. If we can just go to that slide, please. So that's um, the initial part covered. Um, unfortunately, one of the, well, fortunately or unfortunately, one of the things that everybody loves about India when they first get here is the rapid pace of change. And it becomes very intriguing and, and you have to be able to adopt and adapt very quickly. And um, we've had to do that today as um, unfortunately, one of our speakers dropped off at the last minute. I do like to think uh, highly of myself, but unfortunately we've lost Jeet as he's been called into a meeting with the Prime Minister's office about the G20. So I know when I'm beat, um, so I will be doing a, a little bit of a, a deep dive into the Digital India program and how that's reshaped the economy. We'll then hear from uh, Vice President at Invest India, Sai Sudha, about why you should do business in India, what uh, the Indian government uh, is trying to do to create an attractive environment uh, for business to come in from overseas. We've got Mayank Manish from uh, OPZ Axiom Holographics. So they're a fantastic success story um, around how a, a joint venture was established in market. And so Mayank's gonna take us through some of his experiences operating that business here um, as the person on the ground representing uh, the Australian entity. And then we're going to have a panel discussion. Uh, my uncle as well beyond that. We've got Gavin Standen, who's uh, an executive partner ecosystem with India, uh, for India with Telstra. So Gavin is one of the senior most people at Telstra in India. He's been with them for quite a long time. And, um, you know, we work very closely with Gavin and uh, he has some great insight on the bigger end of town in terms of what Telstra see as the value they can derive from India back to Australia. And Omkrant Rath, who is the senior project manager um, from Mighty Startup Hub, and really appreciate that he's been able to join us with the last minute change as well to the agenda uh, with Jeet, unfortunately not able to join. So yeah, that's, that's gonna be the agenda. So look, I'm gonna dive in a little bit uh, to talk about Digital India. Um, so if we can jump to that first slide there. Um, one of the big things, a lot of companies um, who maybe have looked at India before, they maybe uh, come over say five or 10 years ago, um, they won't be aware of the huge transformation um, that has occurred in the market. And a lot of that is driven by the government of India's Digital India program, which was launched in 2015. The aim of the program is as the flagship digital program for the Indian government is to transform India into a digitally empowered society and knowledge economy. What that's really looking at is taking an economy, uh, especially government services, um, but also getting into all other aspects of the economy that was very manual and paper-based um, and large percentages of the economy were unorganized. Um, so the Digital India program, which has adopted a huge number of different arms now, looked at making it easier for companies to access government services, making it easier for individuals to access government services, giving empowerment through digital means to the citizens and allowing government services to be on demand. So. I want to just take a moment here um, because I came to India, I've been in India since uh, 2014, um, operating my own business. I had an ed tech startup and I've seen some of how this narrative has changed India firsthand. Um, in 2015, when the scheme was launched, um, we were doing uh, vocational training uh, for um, parts of the Indian population in, in rural areas. 
And the government of India used this Digital India program as a way of offering training, but in the background, providing bank accounts and an Aadhaar card, which is the, the national identity card to all their citizens um, who access these training services. So through a, a vocational training scheme, they were able to bring millions and tens of millions of people onto the organized banking uh, ecosystem in India and have national identification documents for everyone, which previously they didn't have. Um, now that's really nice, but what it has meant for the economy over time is that now India has a, a burgeoning fintech ecosystem that's built off the back of everyone having a national identification card, everybody having at least one, if not two smartphones and being able to link all of those um, documents, your Aadhaar card, your phone number, your bank account to create a, a fantastic um, payments ecosystem on top of which so much innovation has come. So that's just a little anecdotal uh, story of mine, but having seen that transformation over time, it, it's amazing to see how the Indian uh, ecosystem has adapted when at the time I just thought, oh, they're running a skill development program but there was a, a narrative to all of this that's really changed the economy. So we'll jump to the next slide. Um, so where does it go? So uh, look, India is trying to create 1 trillion US dollars of economic value just from this scheme. And, and that's gonna translate to 60, 65 million jobs in India. As I talked about, there's an explosion in FinTech, but having this core infrastructure, having the rails in place um, for a digital economy is also seeing huge growth in health, education, agri-tech, um, and, and a whole bunch of other areas. So, you know, the government's running a lot of these programs. Um, there's an open API set of guidelines that I'm sure Jeet would have been able to speak to more and maybe, um, we can hear from Mr. Rath a little bit later about that, um, that the Ministry of Economics and Information Technology is running, um, but that's enabling people to plug into the ecosystem, plug into the rails. Um, so, and look, India has a very clear aspiration um, to attract investment and to attract business and to, to grow through partnering with uh, global economies like Australia. And so one of those, um, one of the offsets of all of this is that uh, not only does it make it easier to do business here, but you know, hopefully over time it makes it easier uh, for capital flow, for you know, borderless capital flow to occur, um, which will make obviously operating business in easier, a, a more stable and, and more enviable environment. So we'll dive into a little bit of this uh, in the panel with the Q&A session, um, but I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Sai Sudha from Invest India, the Vice President of Invest India, to um, come on the screen and, and unmute her microphone and give us a little bit of insight into what the Government of India is doing uh, to attract companies from around the world and especially Australia. So, Sai Sudha, over to you. Thank you, Sam. First of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity for putting together this platform. Um, in my opinion, it is always the right time to talk about um, India, Australia. And uh, today, this moment is uh, more equal than the other moments because we are seeing a sort of a beautiful fruition of the ECTA agreement when we are going, we are looking forward to seeing it you know, unravel and for both our countries to take benefit from them. So I am really excited. This is the first time I am presenting after the signing of the act and the parliament, the first time I'm presenting for Australia. So it makes it even more, uh, you know, special for me. Thank you um, very much. Um, I would like to take you through, I do not have a presentation. It's more of what some of the good work that the government of India has been doing in light of a foreign in light of attracting foreign direct investments, investors, and the right uh, technology and the opportunity that's going to be mutually beneficial for both the nations. 
The government of India has been doing a lot of good work and we have been doing a lot of specific outreach activities in association with Australia as well uh, to see how we can further bolster this uh, particular sentiment. Uh, my name is Sai Sudha. I am from Invest India. Invest India is a national investment promotion and the facilitation agency set up under DPIIT Ministry of Commerce. So the sole mandate, in a sense, Invest India is one of the most important ease of doing business reforms for the foreign direct investors when they are looking at India. Instead of running from pillar to post, India is a very large and a complex country. Agreed, we acknowledge that. But that is, the diversity is also a beauty for it. But in order to not make that an hindrance for investors who are looking at us, looking at India, Invest India is set up as the one point, one stop shop, as the first point of contact to handhold the investors when they are looking at India. Uh, we do have country teams, sector teams, as well as the state teams, where we will be able to help identify your needs and help able to guide you up to the point of make uh, you know business advisory location assessment opportunity assessment up to aftercare that is what uh, we do i had the fdi from the cluster of countries in the uh, asia pacific region that's introduction of me and invest india but the most important introduction uh, you know or reassurance that we are here for is to talk about the growth the unprecedented growth India has been seen. One small number is an indication and a testament to that. I think in 2022, this year, India received an uh, overall FDI of about $83.5 billion. India received this year. And this FDI came from about 101 countries across 57 sectors, traditional, non-traditional, emerging sectors as well and it went to 30 different states and this fdi is the eighth consecutive highest ever fdi if this is not the story of india that is going to give you the reassurance um, this should be the story of india that's going to give you the reassurance eighth consecutive year every single year we have surpassed and we have a you know, um, ambitious target of achieving 100 billion, going to the ninth consecutive highest year of receiving FDI in 2023. And I must tell you, we are very, very well on our way. And I would be very excited to share that news with you as soon as we reach that. This trend is not just an indication of uh, you know, investors just trusting the Indian domestic market, the consumption market, but it's more important. This is a factor indicating that the investors are trusting the government of India, are trusting the governance, trusting the policies, trusting the states, trusting what they will be able to get. Gone are the days, like you absolutely rightly pointed out, gone are the days when India was just looked at you know, from a cost arbitrage point of view, today India has so much to offer for mutual growth, not just in terms of ROI as well. Today, we invite, the government of India invites investors not just to make in India, make for India, but make in India and make for the world. Because with the multiple free trade agreements and the, uh, you know, uh, trades that packs that we are signing, it is very, very important that we understand, we understood your need to position India as a base for your export market as well, as well as use India as this huge domestic consumption market as uh, well. Uh, today, India is the number one fastest growing economy, number one in the smartphone data consumer consumption, number one global fintech adopter, number two global retail development index, number two in the internet users, number two mobile manufacturers, it's number three in the world's largest startup ecosystem. Today, we are about 100 plus unicorns and the combined valuation of the 100 plus unicorns is about 300 billion dollar plus it does take a lot for us to just fathom all these numbers and put together we are a population of 1.4 billion people today but this is the reality and this growth unprecedented growth is just 
the beginning. I will also tell you why it's going to be just the beginning. I will point out what has been the growth before, what is the growth now, and what is the growth projected and why I project it so. We are the third largest energy consumer um, as well. Today, India has a GDP of about 8.7 percentage. The manufacturing in India has grown 9.9 .9 percentage during the last year. When I said last year, it's at the helm of the pandemic. I just want to reiterate that as well. I already mentioned close to $84 billion. India received the highest annual FDI last year as well. The FDI equity inflow, and specifically the manufacturing sector, jumped about 76% as well. At this point, I would like to draw your attention to a little bit of a comparison that I want to talk to you. Um, India took about 63 years to achieve her first trillion dollar GDP, right? And she took seven years to achieve her second trillion. And today she has taken less than three years to achieve her next trillion. This is what I wanted to bring your attention to what the growth was, what is the rate, the pace at which we are going. And uh, with all humility, the pace of growth is unstoppable. And Australia is a country that has been from time immemorial, has had close friendship, bilateral economic cooperation and partnership. And this is something we would like to nurture. Welcome the Australian investors to India with a special hand. At Invest India, we have a special Australia desk. So in association with Austrade, Invest India would be very happy to help all investors that are looking at India, any state, any sector, clarification that's extremely simple they do not know much about india they just want to learn about india up to the point of an aftercare where they have been in india you know some of the top names you told have been in india for so long some of the names when they have an aftercare issue resolution we work a, a complete at a gamut of services to ensure our only goal is along with you we want to work for the australian investors to make it easy for them to decode the complexity and tell them today the processes are not complex at all right in 2022 today the gdp i told you is about 3.5 trillion dollars um india at 100 years of independence india 2047 we are expected to have a gdp of 32.8 trillion dollars the manufacturing gdp is about 0.4 we expect it to jump to 6.7 today the per capita of india is about 2000 us or 2163 us dollars in about 20 years it's going to multiply 10 times just in part with the rest of the numbers i told you twenty thousand dollars it also talks about the growth in the purchasing power the higher disposable income the middle class of India, the highest rate of growth, the segment of population that's growing in India is going to be the middle class segment. The middle class segment come with two amazing advantages. One, they are the people that will continue to have an increasing disposable income, number one. And that is the segment that is available for you to work. Excellent skill labor force that are going to work for you. Today, India's most of India today is not powered as per traditional standard, according to, you know, um, the tier one, tier two or tier three cities. Today, most of my India is powered by tier two, three and four cities, not by tier one, I mean, sorry, not by tier one, not the Mumbai, is not the Chennai, is Bangalore, Delhi and so on and so forth, but it's by tier two. During the pandemic, I want to you know, draw your attention to the fact, I think about 50% of the luxury car sales in India came from my tier two, three, and four cities. During the helm of the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, this point reiterates how, despite the complexity or because of the diversity, India today is positioned as one of the most resilient countries and a nation that resurges so beautifully in the, in the face of any adversity. Uh, India had a zero, almost a non-functional P2 
PPE kit industry, I think in uh, June 20, uh, in March 2020, uh, but by July 2020, India grew up so much to become the world's second largest PPE kit industry. This is in a span of 60 days from a non-existent to the world's second largest. We started producing for India and we started producing to export to the rest of the countries that wanted the PPE kits material supply as well. This is a very beautiful example that talks about how quickly India today is able to adapt to the changes and do so well at it. A lot of this definitely is uh, because of the uh, reforms, incentives, schemes that the government of India, the good work of government in India is able to you know, formalize and roll out as policies um, as well. There are multiple reforms, landmark reforms that have come out in the last two to three years. The corporate tax, it, it, it's, it's a milestone. I feel people don't talk about it enough. So I may take it upon myself to just mention a line about uh, that every time. Today, the corporate tax rate for new companies is about 15% for new units, right? And, uh, you know, uh, for old, uh, uh, the old rate, it was reduced from about 34 to 25 for the old companies and for new companies today it stands at 15 percent and if you do and if we do our uh, comparison and analysis india is one of the lowest amongst vietnam mexico indonesia thailand any other country that one would look at for cost effective uh, you know uh, measures so we are on par uh, with that multiple label reforms have been um, you know uh, brought into place about you know 25 to 30000 i think 33 plus 1000 compliances have been dropped to make it more easy and for the process to be more singular today in India. There are project development cells and for group of secretary all this with the only intention to make it easy and quick for the uh, investors. We have something called the national single window that we are developing, which is about 70%. It is already live, 70% up and running, where investors at the click of the button, wherever in the world can get to know about whichever state, whichever land parcel they want, what is the connectivity, what is the infrastructure, what is the logistical peripherals around it, they can find it at the click of a button, which will involve all the and the licenses, compliances, process, applications, everything they need, they can get to know there from a regulatory point of view and apply there as well. Most of my states and significant amount of my ministries are already there. The goal is, I think, by um, financial year 2023, close of financial 2023, we would have 100 onboarded 100% 100, uh, percent, um, of uh, them. So that's broadly what I wanted to talk about to give you a flavor of how India today is positioned and how we wish for more and more partnerships with Australian and Australian investors. It is also really wonderful and heartening to see uh, Australia and India being together in this excellent uh, supply chain resilience initiative in an attempt to strengthen the entire Indo-Pacific region and to help strengthen the supply chain resilience of not just our nations, but of the entire world by positioning ourselves as a strong collaborative partners. So certainly I look forward to working more and more with all of you and with investors to see what is the best we can offer to you for our mutual growth and benefit. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Sam, over to you. Thank you, Sai Sutta, and look, unbelievable level of detail and some of the statistics you put forward are just uh, I think I used the word <laughs> eye-watering before but you know 80 odd billion USD in FDI in, in the last year um, maybe the question should be coming from everyone is how do we get a slice of <laughs> of India um, if, if so many people are looking to invest into India but um, I think some of the interesting points you touched on and um, really, I think we'll have you stick around on the panel as well, because there'll be some good questions coming in. But around supply chain resilience that you mentioned there at the end, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, Australian companies showing an interest in India. Um, there's, uh, you know, an opportunity for manufacturing here. There's an opportunity for um, 
you know, doing a lot of work in, in tech companies as well in the back end uh, that adds a huge amount of value and also helps um, Australian companies be less reliant on uh, other countries that uh, maybe they, they don't want to be so reliant on anymore. So we've we've seen that across both manufacturing and tech becoming a, a central theme. And, and I think from a, a, a government perspective, that's what the quad's all about. Um, you know, it's it's about building better supply chains um, for for mutual friends. So, look, I'm not going to um, talk too much. I'd, I know everybody's dying to hear from uh, an Australian success story in the market. So, I'll ask uh, Mayank to uh, unmute and, and to come on on the screen. Um, Mayank is the the CEO of the Indian entity of Axiom OPZ Holographics and um, they're a fantastic business. Fortunately for me, they're based here in Bengaluru, where I am, and um, they have a really uh, innovative product and, and the model in which they've brought that to the market in partnership between an Australian and Indian entity is really fascinating. So I don't want to spoil the surprise. I'm going to hand over to Mayank um, to talk about his, uh, his venture into India with um, yeah, the joint venture that he's got with an Australian entity. All right. Thanks a lot, Sam. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to just share my screen real quick. And I'm just going to confirm that you all are able to see it and I'll, I'll just get started. Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, before I jump into, um, you know, what, what we've done uh, in terms of tying up with an Australian uh, company, bringing it to India together, and now working to scale up uh, you know, that business, both in India as well as globally by joining hands together. I thought it's best to at least you know, explain uh, or at least give you an idea of uh, you know, what we are doing, what we're working on. We work on this futuristic technology called 3D holograms. A lot of companies have tried holograms in the past and they continue to do so, but uh, Axiom Holographics from Brisbane, Australia, is one of the first ones in the world who's made uh, interactive, immersive holograms and has made them uh, you know, economically viable. Yes, people have uh, managed to get programmable holograms in the past and they've costed a million, two million dollars uh, a piece. But you know, here's someone who's actually done that innovation uh, and, and it's wonderfully led by uh, Bruce Dell from Axiom in Brisbane. Um, and I got in touch with him about, I, I think this was about four years back, five years back, and we started talking about what he was working on. Uh, and I was looking at, uh, you know, setting up some, some innovative uh, uh, business uh, in India. This, this is going to be, uh, this was going to be my uh, second startup venture. So uh, at that point of time, I realized that, you know, we were nearly ready with these holograms. And what holograms are is that they use the, the concept of bending of light rays to create virtual scenarios, whether it's a hologram table, uh, you know, where we show holograms on, on a two meter by two meter table for conversation, we convert a whole hologram, a whole wall into 3D holograms, uh, all virtual, we can even convert a full room into a 3D hologram. So multiple options out here, uh, and, and we build experiences wherein you know, various objects, people, places, all of them can be converted into these, uh, you know, virtual, um, you know, setups and, and environments. So any idea that's out there uh, for our client, any experience that they want to build and what used to be physical can now be made virtual, can now be made holographic. So we, we call ourselves as being beyond VR, AR. Um, campus walkthroughs, configurators, digital twins, flyover tours of places and cities, object scanning, photogrammetry, walkthroughs of real estate, offices, et cetera, factories. We create real 3D holographic tours of places, um, uh, 3D 360 tours. And we've even gone ahead and created digital personas. Now, how did this all happen? So here's what we did. The strategy for India was you know, very basic. We did not overcomplicate it. We first created a plan. The first idea was to you know, get down there, talk to uh, you know, the people uh, in Brisbane, get them over, uh, you know, show them around uh, how complicated yet how exciting 
the opportunity in India can be, and then sit together. And we created our plan so that both sides could invest, both sides could innovate further and implement this, this entire plan. And this was good about, I think, three, three and a half years back or four years back would be a safe time to say. We built our first experience center and uh, you know, it was all through COVID that we had to get this done. So challenging times, yes, but because the technology was futuristic, we picked up the right business model. Uh, we decided to um, you know, go ahead and do the investment at that point in time. And then we did the most important thing. You know, we've got a lot of use cases from Australia, but then we had to indigenize them. We had to create something which is very, very applicable for the Indian market, which is different. No matter how one looks at it, one must remember you can't sell the same solution in the same way. It's, it's not a cookie cutter uh, you know, kind of an approach that you just pick up something and you just put it out here. So we created that portfolio of relevant use cases and we indigenized the product. Uh, you know, I would have loved to be able to say that, yeah, we can just use that you know, $100,000 uh, hologram display and just take it here and put it up out here. It doesn't work that easily. We'll be able to you know, implement a few, but we won't be able to scale it in that case. So we joined hands. We decided to you know, sign up agreements so that the IP was well protected. Of course, uh, you know, we're getting in the IP from an Australian company, which is Axiom Holographics. We are working on it here. We are enhancing it here. So we made sure that both sides were very comfortable with the legal arrangement. And then we went forward uh, to, to create the indigenized product, which is for this market. And you know, that's something that we sell purely in the region. It's not a market where uh, you know, one can reach. It's a, it's a pretty large and a diverse geography, uh, you know, the Indian subcontinent. So we had to you know, get in the right partnerships to cover the entire country. And once all of that was done, we actually truly started marketing only last year, middle of last year. And then we saw that inflow of business happen. And that was so important for us because that's when we said, all right, let's go ahead, let's implement. And this year we've been focusing on expansion of our business. And that's what we're going through. We're scaling it up now. Um, and, and that's what's going on. I'm going to be quick in, in moving on to, to the next section that I wanted to cover because uh, you know, the time was short for me to speak and I don't want to miss anything. So after the strategy, we went straight into the risks. And the reason that we wanted to mitigate them was because if we do not acknowledge the risks when we are entering this market, if we do not mitigate them well enough, there is a, you know, it, 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 there's a high chance that it may not succeed uh, to the level that you want it to happen. So the first thing, the, the risk that we were taking was we were entering into a totally new area where people were not even talking holograms. And we said, it's okay, we'll mitigate it by going all out, we did our research to say, does India spend on infrastructure, on experience centers or experiences? Is India investing enough in experiences of the future? Uh, is, is concepts like uh, you know, VR, AR, holograms, metaverse, et cetera, catching on? Is it going to be futuristic? Is it gonna be there for the long run? And we said, okay, people are not talking, but they will be talking about it. And look, it's happened for us. So you know, this year has been so busy because people are currently focusing on it. So that was the first risk that we uh, you know, took. The second risk we had to take was to spread ourselves across sectors. Not an easy market to cater to, yeah. If we decided that we'll only enter the real estate market and build experiences for them, it could have been risky because you know, we, may, we may see ups and downs in, in that segment. We said, okay, we look at education, we look at museums, we look at tourism, we look at smart cities. We picked up the pulse on those sectors that were either spending at that point in time or were planning to spend in the next three to five years. And that's the horizon that you know, uh, startups like us uh, focus on. And it actually worked out. We said, all right, let's not go in for 20 sectors. Let's just pick up six or seven, but it's worked out for us. We've been able to balance that off very well. And the final thing was, how much to invest? You know, there is a risk that both the sides are taking. In, in our case, we said a partnership should be fair. We invest from our side. We are expecting the Australian entity to invest over here. 
We're making use of the wonderful schemes that India offers. I mean, the, the government is very supportive. The, uh, the Australian ecosystem in India has never been so vibrant. And we said we will go all out, secure all the help that we're getting from you know, all, all these counterparts. And, and believe me, I have worked across, you know, I've worked across US, Europe, Australia, Africa, UK, everywhere. I've never seen such good support uh, when it comes to a partnership between Indian and Australian companies. So uh, this is, you know, from a person who's founded and running this company. Uh, we were able to do this investment because we felt there was a scope in it. And we said we also want to be profitable. We just didn't want to set up a business that keeps, you know, pumping in money. I know it's an innovation-led business, so you need to make that investment. But our OPEX profitability was important. We kept that discipline. We kept that focus. And we actually achieved it, uh, you know, the last financial year. So what was our win-win strategy or what is our win-win strategy? It's, it's, it's a partnership that's just blooming. It's, it's not even, uh, I mean, I would say it's at a nascent stage right now. Uh, a, we're taking the IP from Australia, what's been innovated there, and we're selling it in India. We're enhancing it here so that it can be expanded globally. And all these wonderful experiences that I'm talking about, the strength of India and the software and the creativity uh, in terms of building, let's say, you know, holographic digital personas or 3D 360 tours, photogrammetry, renders, walkthroughs, digital twins, all of that is IP from India. We created those platforms and we're selling not only in Australia, but globally. So we said, let it be a win-win for a mutual success. And that's what has worked uh, pretty good in, in this particular case. And finally, I think I must talk very quickly about the must-haves. When you're looking at doing business in India, I must highlight patience is very important, no matter what anyone says. Uh, as long as you're patient with the India market, you will see results. I mean, this is something that works out from the smallest of businesses in India to the large corporates. It's not a quick and easy one. The presence. You need to have a presence locally for sure, but you also need a good local person or a good local partner. Because, you know, if you're just going through that route of sitting out there, sitting away and trying to, you know, run the business out here, uh, you may go wrong in one or two or three places, which may be very heavy on the investment that you make. Indigenization, which I spoke about, I think is a must. Do not try to just take what you have and, you know, say that, okay, all right, let's go out and sell it out here. That's a very, very tough one. So definitely get something customized uh, for the Indian market. Uh, from food to cars to technology, everyone who sells in India, everyone will acknowledge the fact that ind indigenization is important. And finally, uh, if someone tells you, yeah, it's not price sensitive or you know, whatever, the India is known to leapfrog on technology, but you got to nail down the pricing, the right pricing. It's not like you've got to sell cheap all the time. That's not the thing. But you got to get the price right uh, because India likes to see, you know, the value in what they're taking. So, you know, that was a very, very quick one uh, from my side, from strategy to the risks to the, the to a win-win, uh, you know, proposition for all sides and what you must have to be su successful in the India market. So that's what I wanted to touch upon. Uh, thank you. And back to you, Sam. Thanks, Mayank. And um, just fascinating uh, again another level of detail and insight um, that is really really valuable and I think just the the partnership model which you've uh, established which complements the strengths of what the Australian company can bring to market what you talk about as in you know indigenization of the technology and the local connect um, is is just a fantastic model and look rather than sort of dive into it now I think let's jump on to our, our panel q a session so i'll get um gavin omkaranth and even uh, sai suda if you can put your um videos on we've got a few questions coming in through the chat um on slido and i suggest anybody jump onto slido.com and uh, hashtag global tech um to to put in any questions we'll be um, answering the ones by time uh, that have the most votes on them. So feel free to vote up anybody else's questions. But um, just to kick things off, uh, maybe I'd like to ask Gavin, um, you know, 
what is the opportunity in the Indian market for yourself? In, you know, if you look at it from Telstra's perspective, you're a big organization, you've got a big presence, you know, a famous organization in Australia, you've been here for a long time. What's in it for you? What's in it for Telstra to be in India? Great question and thanks, Sam. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so the way that I would really answer that, Sam, is on two folds. The first one is the future in India looks very, very promising because of two, because of a couple of things. First one is the amount of future ready skills that you have is unmatched in the world, which means your supply demand is really, uh, I mean, is, is taken care of. The second one is the resources and employees that join a company in India want to become a CEO the next day. And the way you want to channel that energy is that entrepreneurial energy because that is when innovation really starts to bud in everyone's mind. Because the end of it is not about just the entrepreneurial zeal, but is that innovation, is that reimagining, that re-engineering capability that's constantly burning as a passion within everyone's, uh, you know, everyone's gut. And the second part of my question would be the scale, the time to market, the speed to production again is unmatched in the world. So if I really put all this together, the demands and supply gap is addressed. The investment from cost to value has really changed because we came in for cost, we stay for value. And another element that we should not forget staying in India is the scale, constant sustenance of scale. You know, just to give you some numbers, I think so you did mention we are large, but how do I convert that in terms of numbers? We are, we have, we invest almost about a billion dollars every year in India, just in terms of our, our investment. And we need to know when we need to buy, when we want to blend and when we want to, uh, you know, uh, could I say, you know, make, make, make by ourselves. So you buy from partners because you have a very vibrant uh, service integrator or a supplier system integrator uh, landscape. You need to know when to make it your own by creating your own GCC or your captive center. And as you know, the captive centers are really booming by the hour. And you need to know when to blend and co-create with our partners in India because the depth and scale that we have in India again is unmatched. So one of the reasons that we constantly look at India is you need to be ready to stay invested for the long haul. And that's when you're going to get results. Thanks, Gavin. And look, um, I think one of the things you touched on there was innovation. And I think we see a lot of small business in Australia you know, coming forward with some very innovative solutions. And I think I might just throw to um, Omkrant here because there is a question in the chat about how these small businesses with an innovative technology, um, you know, with your role at the mighty startup hub, um, you know, how, how can they enter the Indian market with the support? Or, uh, you know, what, what can they do to approach the Indian market? Like what are the startups doing that you're seeing coming into the market? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity first. So uh, addressing the questions, uh, India is uh, having a diverse program of bilateral collaborations. Okay. So uh, we in Mati Startup Hub is collaborating with different companies, uh, different countries in, across the Euro of Asian countries and other countries. We're providing them in bilateral support. I mean, providing them in the Indian market, introducing their products in the Indian market, as well as bringing them uh, to, uh, I mean, sending Indian startups to their country and bringing their startups to Indian country to showcase our, I mean, showcase our uh, ecosystem here and providing them a market access to our uh, different uh, startups who are working on these areas as well as we are also connecting to them to big corporates in India who are working on this digital space especially because the strength of India lies in the digital space uh, at the recent because we do have our uh, different uh, breakthrough in last uh, two and a half years we have created a lot of things in digital space including the COVID portal and you can say uh, the different uh, UPI interface and all these things so uh, the startups who are working on different areas and especially on digital space as well as on uh, working on SMEs, they can collaborate us and they can join us uh, uh, to uh, integrate the SMEs platform into our digital platform so that we're creating a vibrant ecosystem okay, all together. 
and talking about especially on the uh, regarding uh, i will mention one uh, more thing here in uh, i mean this forum that india took the presidency of g20 in this form starting from december 1st so we are also i mean uh, conceptualizing one program called digital india alliance where we will be inviting all the g20 countries and all the supported countries to showcase uh, the startup ecosystem in, in india and especially we are doing few i mean uh, bilateral uh, changes of startups and we are bringing around 20 to 15 startup of each country to provide them a market here and uh, get them access to our market uh, get them access to our funding source we are providing in some i mean in some manner and from ideation to the scale of startups and that is the whole idea that we are right now pushing in to g20 presidency as well as prior to this also we have a lot of programs that in which we are collaborating with different state governments by through our uh the local partners as well as the main partners like fiki we have collaborated and cii we have collaborated and uh, germany recently i just wanted to give an example with germany we have collaborated with jinsep there in germany they are our um, uh, local ecosystem partner there in germany and here in cii is a local ecosystem partners so we are developing six demographics there in germany and in india uh, to create uh, to create different sector uh, specific uh, startup support ecosystem so we are uh, developing six uh, locations in we, we have identified and developing six location in germany and we developed uh, developed, uh, developed six locations in india and uh, creating a uh, sector specific startup ecosystem there india is doing in terms of providing them the uh for the startups i mean the market and everything so if they if anyone is interested then the, that you know most will come to join us and we, we could enact the different programs uh by collaborating with austin also i recently had a conversation at your bangalore conclave on bt during bts you know me and my ceo we both were there so we had a conversation regarding what can be done uh to uh for the australia market and how can we collaborate and probably you might remember for a few months back there is a uh, visit to your uh, austrian uh, startup ecosystem to our ministry event so few people have visited so after that i just, we just wanted to take it forward and create some vibrant startup ecosystem between Austra australia and india yeah so i'm going to jump in there on ground uh because yes that's one of the things one of the other questions that's come in from uh uh, the people is asking specifically how how Telstra can support the startups, but I think more, you know more broadly, um, you know to to touch on the question about you know how do you come in, how do you find a partner, you know what can be done. Um, big companies like Telstra, and, and I'll let Gavin jump in here, but big companies like Telstra are working with Austrade. We're working with um, organisations like uh, the Ministry and also invest india who have startup india um, to create a an international bridge that's going to see uh, an opportunity for startups to come in uh, to india and to both learn about the market and then look to identify partners but maybe gavin the, the question is how can uh, telstra help out you're the you're the head of the partner ecosystem maybe you want to touch on that Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, Sam. Um, there, are, there, are, there are a couple of things that I would really encourage uh, startups to align on. First one is relevance. So whenever we look at a startup, we look at the relevance and how we can really uh, fit that startup capability or IP within the system. But I would rather take a slightly philosophical view to this. And the philosophical view that we do is, as a business, we constantly challenge our status quo on three fronts. Who's a champion, who's our challenger, and who's a disruptor? And the third option of a disruptor fits with the startups really, really well. Because startups really challenge status quo. The champion and challenges are usually a lot of our partners. They are the big ones, they're the big system integrators in the country, like your TCS, Wipros, and the extensions of the world. But the disruptors are actually the, the, the startups. So in terms of the first point that I mentioned between relevance and disruption, if we and, and companies like start like Telstra really have a huge appetite for disruption and a huge appetite for relevance because when you really bring them together, take it from me, we can really leapfrog our, our competition. And the important piece is when you say relevance, how can I really understand if I'm relevant or not relevant? You need to understand the customer journey that we undertake in every company. Because once you understand the customer journey, then it becomes easier to really drive that relevance factor really to the core. Because understand one thing, 
digital skills which used to be an enabler earlier today has become core of every company and if you really bring in those digital skills those digital changes and those radical changes that we are really looking for take it for me we will really absorb it because if you look at telstra today and uh, i'm not sure how many of you know today we are the fastest deployers of 5g in the world we will cover the whole of australia by end of this year using 5g and we'll technically uh, you know shut down 3g by end of next year so you can really see we have leapfrogged not because of just the 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 monopoly that we that we hold in the country is because we have managed to bring startups into the mainstream we were able to get a couple of startups who are increasing our last mile connectivity today and they have managed to accelerate our deployment by probably a couple of years so there are fantastic use cases we really have a huge appetite for startups and radical thinking but at the end of it relevance and being a disruptor is going to be key Sam. Thanks, Gavin. And I'm going to ask a really quick question of Mayank, and then we're going to have to start to wrap things up. Mayank, a lot of questions about partnership, a lot of questions about how to find a partner. But one of the really pertinent questions is, what, what's the biggest challenge that you've seen coming in? And then what's the one thing that has been quite uh, exciting or quite intriguing that you've learned in your journey, you know, having your partnership with Axiom? Great. So I'll <clears throat> I look at the challenge part, um, and I think the honestly the biggest challenge that was there in building this partnership, uh, I I really shouldn't beat around the bush. It was establishing trust between the two entities. The fact that both India and Australia are working together towards a common goal not saying that this is OPZ separate, this is Axiom Holographic separate and being able to brand that together as an OPZ Axiom and having a common goal. Uh, you know, getting to that point was the biggest challenge for us. You know, uh, it, it's a fact, we're, we're across the seas, uh, you're getting you know, to know new individuals. Um, there have been success stories and there have been stories that are not uh, you know, so pleasant. So I think building that trust through reliable models, through reliable mechanisms uh, has been the biggest challenge that we faced. Uh, and the most exciting thing I feel is, uh, you know, once we identified what was our goal, what was our target market, when we started working towards it and implementing it, like I said, the, you know, having more than what we can handle was the phase that was most exciting for us. And it continues to be so because we're continuing to invest in the partnership. So I would say the right plan or the right strategy after taking into account, you know, adequate research and adequate statistics and not just going by gut feel. That's been the most exciting uh, element. Of course, apart from the, the work we do, holograms itself is an exciting area. So, you know, that, yeah, that takes great. Care. And I can um, attest yes. to that. So look, um, there's a bunch of questions about ECTA, the um, agreement that was reached and, and passed through the parliament very, very recently between Australia and India. So I'm just going to very quickly touch on that, then hand over to, to Divya. Um, so ECTA has been a, a landmark in the, in the bilateral relationship. And um, what we saw was the two countries recognise the importance of the partnership, each side. Uh, and in doing that, they came to the table with a lot of concessions that were really valuable to both sides um, that maybe traditionally Australia and India hadn't provided concessions to other countries in those areas. So what does it mean for technology companies? There was some wins um, for financial technology companies, for telecoms looking to, to set up here. But what we understand is the bigger wins for tech and for services are going to come in the more comprehensive agreement, which will start to be negotiated this uh, next year coming, we have the Prime Minister visiting the country and there's going to be a number of big announcements coming out about that in 2023. And I think at that time you'll see um, a number of really big wins beyond, say, some of the double taxation avoidance agreements and things like that that have been worked on in the, the last year or so. I'd encourage everyone to go to the DFAT website, um, which has a really good amount of information around all the different sectors. So I think... Um, 
thank you so much to our panelists who gave us so much of their time and their, their valuable knowledge. Um, I just want to touch on one thing and that's what's coming next. So people asked about where they can go, who they can talk to, how do you find a partner, what's, you know, what's the entry. Um, so Austrade, uh, I'm going to say we're the first point of call for you guys. Um, you know, we're going to work very closely with AAA. So if you remember there, we'd love to work with you um, on your India strategy. We have a number of um, market awareness programs that are being built uh, for startups and scale-ups. This is all under a, a funded initiative called the Australia India Innovation Network. So there's going to be some sessions on FinTech, cybersecurity, ag tech, deep tech, clean tech in the coming months, um, starting January. And we're also going to have a number of tech cohorts that visit the market. Um, and I think Simon can talk a, a little bit about some plans they have as well. So what I do is I'd encourage you to reach out to uh, Smriti Sharma, who's based in Sydney and um, handles a lot of the Australia India Innovation Network um, engagement from Australia. If you do have interest, she's your first point of call. We'd love to talk to you about, um, you know, where you see India and your global strategy, provide you some advice, help you identify potential partners, investors, clients in the market, help you develop that strategy. So that's that's what Austrade's here for. We can connect you through to the network of speakers you've heard from today and the plethora of other great stakeholders in the market who can help you. Um, but with that, I'm going to throw to Divya to, um, to talk next. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, and thank you to all of our speakers today. Uh, we certainly heard many reasons, many compelling reasons uh, for Australian companies to engage with the India market. Now, our next session will be the final in the Global Tech Webinar Series. To close out our detailed look at Asian markets, we will feature opportunities in the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. So look forward to having you join us again in February 2023. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.